Hi, I'm Tom Stevenson and welcome to Lecture 5B. This is cost control in construction projects. Uh, today's class, we're going to be introducing lean construction methods. And if you know me uh, pretty well, you'll know that uh, I love uh, thinking in terms of reducing waste and adding value to clients and uh, controlling costs. It, it's something that I find to be fascinating and uh, brings up a lot of problems and the problems are actually fun in construction. That's, there's never a dull moment in construction. And so that's one of the, the great things about uh, working in construction management. And lean thinking is really a good thing to do, whether your project is going full out lean, integrated project delivery, uh, last planner system, or whether it's adopting certain components of lean and whether it's just you because you're stuck in a situation where you can't really sort of influence everything, but you can still think in those terms and that'll make you better at what you do as you try to uh, master your craft along that journey, whether it's in construction management, whether it's in a trade or whatever it may be in. Uh, lean works. Lean thinking works everywhere. It works in healthcare. It works in manufacturing, and it works in construction. Uh, so we're going to introduce some of the concepts. Uh, just for today's class, we'll do some introductions to things, and then we'll follow up with uh, more detail in future uh, classes in this course. Uh, so we're going to connect lean to cost control. Well, that's pretty easy to do, and we'll review the eight areas of waste. And then we'll give you uh, our PM tip tool of the week, uh, the five whys. If you recall last week in uh, lecture uh, 4A, uh, we did the direct method. And we've done in previous lectures, we've done uh, VUCA, uh, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. Uh, we've done the uh, Pareto principle, the 80-20 uh, rule and I'm not thinking of what the other one is, so you can go back and check uh, the videos uh, for that. I think it's probably in Lecture 3 and 3A and 3B. So uh, let's get started. What is Lean Construction? Well, I took this from the Lean Construction Institute of Canada uh, website, and there's their, their source, um, very uh, excellent website to visit. Every country will have its own uh, sort of central uh, basis of where you can uh, access information about what lean is. You can you know, check the UK, you can check the US, uh, you can check all over, the, all over the, the globe on that. It is widespread. And so what we think about with uh, lean is two things we really think about in a big way is adding value to the customer and uh, reducing or eliminating waste. The one thing I'll tell you right now is the customer is a little bit different thinking right off the bat. The customer is not, everybody always thinks it's the client, right? Whoever is your client who is paying your bill. But really when we think with lean, we think about whoever's providing something for somebody else, uh, that's your customer. And so even if the, the client is uh, returning a question that you would ask, like in the form of an RFI, uh, then in that case, um, they're, you know, they're giving you information. So you're their client in that case, the roles get reversed. So that's the way Lean actually thinks about adding value to the customer. Now you might think, well, how's that work? Because it's all about the money, isn't it? Well, when we think about adding value to an overall project, if we think about people in different ways when they're providing something for us as our customer, then we want to serve them better. And if we serve people better and we build that sort of team environment, then the job will be much more engaging and collaborative as opposed to kind of thinking in terms of it's only the client and who cares about this other subcontractor that's in my way? Who cares about this supplier? So it's a different way of thinking right off the get-go with that, but adding value to the customer. Of course, customer does mean your client as well. Uh, so it, its roots are from manufacturing and I've said this in previous classes, so it's 
evolved out of uh, the Japanese manufacturing systems. Uh, quality control engineers, uh, experts, uh, Deming, Duran were among the, the beginning ones that really sort of helped it take root. Of course, there are some uh, uh, Japanese uh, uh, quality experts that were heavily involved in that process as well. And uh, it really sort of took off as a way of making improvements in manufacturing. We could do a whole course just on that for sure. Uh, and so we think about uh, projects and we think about uh, adding the value. We think about also uh, maximizing value, minimizing waste at the project level. And we think about that as being performance. We also think about uh, how we coordinate the work. Big, that one here is a big line item right here. This involves what we call LPS, the Last Planner System. And we'll talk about that in another class. Uh, when we talk about pull planning and we talk about phase scheduling, we talk about uh, the short-term planning process, uh, planning from the end of the project backwards, different way of thinking, and then how as you get closer to the work, you have more information and you can detail it better and you can get stronger and stronger commitments from the people involved, especially when they were engaged at the beginning of the development of the schedule. Big difference there than traditional methodologies for scheduling. And trust me, I, I'm somewhat of an expert going from the beginning of a project scheduling forward, and it was a bit of a learning curve going from the end of the schedule backwards. But doesn't matter, you work it backwards to the beginning, that gives you a lot of good information and then you can always check it going forward as well. That's the way I look at it. There's a great reframing tool and it's called if in doubt, invert. Well, what are you doing if you're invert, but inverting with the, the end in mind? You're thinking about the end in mind and working it way, your way backwards. So that's part of the last planner system. It's a lot more complicated than I just gave in there, but uh, it is an excellent system and it is one of those very uh, popular uh, systems that is really taking over the marketplace in construction, especially in with the bigger construction companies that I've, I've spent a lot of time consulting with and learning from myself. So those are, you know, you can read through those points uh, on your on your own to see. I'm not going to run through each individual one. I just wanted to get that from their their web page. And I wanted to provide that source uh, link there, which is a good um, area for information on lean construction. So some main points with lean construction, as we said, add value to the client, client or the customer, the customer being whoever, reduce or eliminate waste. Reduce variation, improve flow, minimize buffers. So I talked about in lecture 4A, the Wayfinder concept. You've got a home island, you've got a destination island. They populated the Pacific building and mastering skills to get from one island to the other without GPSs or compasses. I also said they get off course and they have to know where they are and then they have to recalibrate to get back on course. Well, every time you go off course, that's variation. That's variation in the plan. So what you want to do with lean is reduce the variation. If you remember from lecture 4B, uh, I've got in, I'll put in the notes of this so you can just click on the link to that. In lecture 4B, uh, you want to reiterate, you want to get yourself back on course. And all the new technologies, including Last Planner System, it's all about reducing variation. And if we reduce variation, we can improve reliability and predictability, something that in constructions, not we're not exactly known to be the best at. And so that's where lean uh, thinking and lean methodologies can help. Now, we do need buffers. But lean's not big on buffers because every time you got a buffer, you've got like a, a queue forming behind the buffer. And so what we want to do is we want to look at uh, our processes and then we want to reduce the buffers. 
and I'll, we'll see it later in a slide where I'll say we want to remove the rocks. We want to improve the flow. And having a bunch of buffers is kind of like these stop starts that gets in our way. And that's what lean is all about. Now you'll hear in ma manufacturing just in time. That's very difficult in construction just in time. Uh, but we can work towards it. And so we call it the most responsible time. We need to have things in the most responsible time. As close to just in time as we can get it, but we understand there has to be some buffers in there. So that means if I need uh, 300 sheets of drywall, well, maybe it's not a good idea to have them delivered three months ahead of time. They're going to be in the way, right? So what's the most responsible time to get them? And if we're, we have a very reliable drywall supplier, maybe it's the afternoon on the day before where we need it, right? If we don't have such a very uh, reliable drywall supplier, well, we can talk about supply chains in another class, we would maybe give ourselves two days. But we don't want to make it any more than necessary. But at the same time, we don't want it that the workers are waiting for the drywall, right? Uh, so it, we, th we think about two terms that will come up on my slides, work waiting for workers and workers waiting for work. And that aspect of improved flow is about getting rid of both of those. So we have a more continuous flow. And that also involves pull planning, which means you're not, you're not bringing something till somebody needs it. We tend to prioritize resources traditionally over the project. So that means I'm, I'm a subcontractor. I want to get in and I want to get out and get out of my way. There's an old uh, Seinfeld that I think uh, I remember where George Costanza is, Costanza is in a kitchen and there's a fire and he's pushing everybody out of the way and he's trying to get out of the apartment and yelling fire, right? It's kind of like that, how some construction projects work. You know, this trade wants to get in and get out and they're just, anybody that's in their way, uh, they're interfering with them. That's not good for the project. That's probably delaying the project, costing extra money. Maybe they get out okay, likely not, uh, but that's not the way we should be doing it. We, need, we should be looking and engaging and collaborating with the best, most efficient way for the project. That's lean thinking. So the last planner system, as I kind of jumped ahead, is that, that holistic planning system for the whole project. And we'll talk about that in another lecture. As I mentioned, supply chain management is extremely important. If we're going to get things at the most responsible time, we better build strong relationships with our suppliers. And this works much better at to a deeper level. That's the one thing with lean. You can go full out lean with an integrated project delivery contract. It's more difficult to go full out lean without that. If it's a lump sum contract, you have limitations as to what you can do. But you can definitely do the add value, reduce the limited waste, reduce variation, improve flow, minimize bus buffers, pull plan, last plan or system. This design integration, supply chain management gets a little bit more difficult uh, when it's like a lump sum contract. It's not as full that you can go to that. And some of these you can't go full out with either just because of some of the limitations because you're coming in without having influenced the design uh, originally. So that's kind of giving you a sort of a quick uh, overview, but I, I did mention the variation and workflow. So fluctuations in the process, and we see it everywhere in construction where we have these fluctuations and interruptions to the workflow stop start stop start stop start uh, we get so far and the other trade isn't doing what they're supposed to do or they left and they're we can't do what we need to do uh, in that case we've got workers waiting for work we we can't do our work so we go somewhere else then and then that causes other problems behind us for the other trades that are coming behind us in uh, lean we tend to call it the parade of trades and we'll talk about that in another class as well uh, work waiting for workers. So the work's done, but the workers haven't come back. They left the site. Now we wait three or four days. That's pure waste, right? So the schedule is being elongated. And we've been talking about connections with cost control. So every time something like that's happening, 
and say we have management teams on the site or we're renting things, then we're renting things during a period where nothing is getting done. That not waste? That's definitely waste. So that we can think about in those terms. So the flow, it's probably, they, they like to use in uh, the AGC, Associated General Contractors uh, of America, they like to use um, this, this framework of saying uh, flow and you have um, the river flowing and you have rocks in the river and the rocks, they interrupt the smooth flow. So if you've ever done kayaking and that sort of thing, you know, you, you can't go as easily, although it can be nice in the rapids, but... Uh, you can't go as uh, easily if it's a nice, even river that's just flowing fast, right? You have to be very careful of the rocks. You're dodging the rocks. So those dodging of the rocks, that's causing your variation uh, that we're talking about. If we think about the wayfinders going back again to uh, lecture uh, 4B and their process of getting from one island to the other. So we want to remove the, the rocks. We want to look for things that are interrupting the flow of work so that we can go more smoothly. And you can think about things in terms of, well, that, that's why lean works really well in healthcare. There's been different countries that have piloted different projects and there's a lot of hospitals that'll run under lean, um, lean methodology. Uh, you know, you go see a doctor and there's something wrong and a GP is, is very good at sort of saying, okay, so it's in this area, I'm gonna send you to a specialist. Then you make an appointment with the specialist and three months later you go see the specialist and the specialist says oh i want you to get an mri and then you wait two months for the mri and then it takes another uh month for the specialist to see you again like you can see how this is going it takes a long period of time there's rocks in that river uh, so there's been some countries that have set up clinics where there's if somebody has a specific area that potentially is um, can be pre-identified roughly they'll have a practitioner nurse check that person if if it's uh, something that needs to see the specialist the specialists are there they let them go wait they see the specialist that day they have an mri machine in the area the specialist just sends them for the mri and then they have the results within a day or so compared to four or five months. Well, if it's something like a malignant tumor, that's a big deal, right? So um, that's looking at uh, m removal of the rocks. Traffic, same deal. We get all these interruptions in flow. Everybody that's listening to this, you've been stuck in traffic. And that interrupts the flow of work. Uh, we can think about, uh, you know, as, as cars merge on to a highway, it slows down the existing cars. It interrupts the flow of work. If you look at, uh, the Japanese did this sample where they looked at the uh, traffic jams and they had these cars go around in a circle. And there's videos on YouTube on this and you'll see that it starts off pretty good. So they're all told to go 40 kilometers an hour and they're all going, but I guess somebody gets a little distracted and maybe they go to 30 and then the next car puts their brake lights on and then there's this ripple effect behind it and it kind of goes around uh, the circle and it keeps happening once it starts it keeps happening over and over again that's an interruption in the flow uh, time sheets well we've seen time sheets can uh, have uh, an issue as well so that's why a lot of the productivity software has been working you know the blue beams and all of those other ones that we've been mentioning uh, that will allow people to quick enter things. If we've got to put it on a piece of paper and then maybe somebody loses the paper or they don't submit the paper or we got to do double or triple entry of the same information, that's interrupting the flow and resource uh, efficiency. So we look to remove some of the rocks that improves the flow. And then the uh, Associated General Contractors Association uh, kind of uh, does the aspect of, okay, so now we got the river we don't see any rocks, but you know what? There's more rocks below the surface. So that's lower the river so that we can expose more rocks and try to remove them. That's the continuous improvement. You never stop, right? So just because you remove some of the rocks doesn't mean it's done. You can always do it better. So that's lean thinking as well. 
So lean construction, it identifies, well, seven areas of waste and they added one very important one. So it's really eight areas of waste. You may read different lean, um, especially when you get into lean manufacturing and depending when it was written and done, uh, you might see seven, but the eighth one is very important. So uh, when we think about waste, we think about non-value adding activities are pure waste. So something that doesn't add value. Um, and then we have essential non-value adding activities. So we have two kinds. We have non-value adding activities, pure waste, but we also have essential non-value activities. Project management, that is an essential non-value adding activity. When we when lean defines value, what you might be saying, what do you mean? You know, of course, managing projects adds value to it. Yeah, it, it adds value to the construction of the project. But the client, the end client, when they uh, when the person moves into this house over here, right? When they move into that house, they don't care that you had this wonderful schedule. They don't care that you. Um, you know, the, the time that you spent getting permits and with the inspectors, what they care is that the house is meeting their requirements, that what they thought it meets their expectations. That's not value added for them. Uh, obviously, you needed it to be able to construct the house. But at the same time, if you can construct the schedule better, faster, smarter, that's good. So that's why it's essential non-value adding activities, but it's essential. If we can reduce it, we definitely want to do that. Non-value adding activities, just, you know, if we can get totally rid of those, that'd be, that'd be marvelous. That'd be marvelous. Or at least reduce them. Some things it's very hard to totally get rid of, but that's always our, our lofty goal with lean. And we know all about goals from previous classes. And smart goals, by the way, is part of lean construction methodology and reliable promising. So the eight types of waste and lost profit uh, in lean construction, and I added lost profit. I'm tying it to cost control. This is the course cost control, but I believe in my heart that the lean part is very important from the cost control part. Waste is typically money going down the chute. So uh, we've got defects waiting transportation of goods, motion, inventory, overproduction, unnecessary process steps, incorrect use of talent or underutilized talent. This is the one that kind of uh, is the extra one uh, that we'll talk about as well. I kind of did those pictures. If you watched uh, 5A uh, before this uh, uh, video, you would have seen uh, me uh, doing some block work. Well, this was actually me doing that same project uh, on my house when I was 20. Uh, and so this would have been around 1980. And so you can forgive the no hard hat maybe in this particular case. Uh, my father-in-law, no hard hat. Uh, but uh, definitely the world has changed. You would have hard hat for sure uh, doing this kind of work. Uh, but back then, uh, to, this was my own house. I was 20. I bought the house when I was 19, got married when I was 19. Uh, these are my niece and nephew. Uh, and uh, to save some money to excavate for the foundation and the footings, dig it by hand. No mini excavator, no nothing. So you have to go down minimum four feet, went down to the footings of the house, which were about four feet. Uh, and uh, did it uh, that way. Now, you can see that uh, the old porch, which was kind of small, but had concrete, I had to break off the concrete off the first part of it so that uh, where the new steps would be would be over here. This all had to be excavated out eventually. And the excess is being put here, and then you got the excavated earth that's gonna start to build up over here. And of course, then did all the block work. And you see the earth over here. When I finished the block work, this is where the waste comes in. Uh, this is where rework comes in. Uh, you know, maybe not uh, the brightest crayon in the pack when I was 20. So uh, we uh, uh, basically did the block work around. These are a six inch block. So that was a pretty good backup block for the stonework. 
but uh, put the earth, because it saved money, put the earth to fill it in so that when you pour the slab on top, uh, it'll, you can easily pour the slab and that's fine because it didn't have a cantina or a cold cellar underneath it, as they would say. Uh, so the idea was to fill it up and uh, then I got a little bit greedy. I got the idea, the light bulb went on over here and I said, oh, there's a little bit extra earth. Let's not take it away. Let's just put water in this. And when, once I filled it up with the dirt and then it'll settle because when you excavate, the earth bulks up. So looking for a bright shortcut, but of course, when put the water there, now I fortunately I'd never, I hadn't done the stonework yet. I just had done the block work. I was having a coffee and I noticed that the joints started to open up, right? The joints started to open up. And uh, as the joints started to open up, it came away and it was just a big muddy mess because the hydrostatic pressure the block being fairly green. Maybe I did it two or three days after the block was laid. And then you put water in it. It would have been fine with just the earth, but then to put all that water in it was too much for it. So that is a defect. That is basically rework, uh, having to do that. I thought doing, maybe giving you my own example of that would be uh, pretty good because I'm perfectly willing to admit uh, you make mistakes. The important thing is you don't keep doing that. So you can bet whenever I did a house, whenever I did an addition, that that was always shored up and there was always strong shoring in place and uh, to ensure that it was uh, going to hold it up. And I wouldn't put water along a foundation until it was laterally supported. So in other words, uh, the top portion uh, was laterally supported. Uh, if it was a house or something of that nature. And something like this, I would not. So the end product actually, even though you had to do it again, uh, came out okay, as I mentioned in le the previous lecture. Uh, but not without rework. And so there, every project has things in it. And I'm not here to say that lean is about that you're never going to have a problem again. Lean is about if you have better engagement with people, you collaborate, you do a lot of pre-planning in the early stages, you can reduce a lot of these elements. And if you think about some of the things in the way that we just discussed with variation and pull planning and reducing batching and last planner system, and there's a whole toolbox of tools that you can use in Lean as well, including the one at the end here, which is the five whys, that can be really helpful for being successful. So defects, enough, enough uh, with my uh, mistakes, but it, you know what, looking back at it, I wouldn't have it any other way. I learned from it and that's uh, an important aspect. And can your team learn from it? And can your company learn from it? And can you communicate that out so that you improve as you go along? This is a, a more recent example that I noticed and you may have seen this before, but uh, this is, uh, so there's one stairs uh, here, uh, it was put in the wrong spot and now they had to put it in the correct spot, some sort of uh, zoning uh, issue, I believe. So, uh, problem, right? Uh, defects. This, well, this I don't know how they laid it out wrong, but they did. And so now they had to add a, uh, they had to form this up after the fact and add this onto the side to widen the stairs. I think it would have been fairly obvious that this isn't centered and that this was kind of narrow for uh, this porch, but they actually ended up doing it on three different porches. Uh, so there's that old saying that goes uh, that you want to um, cut twice and measure once. You got that, I hope. Measure once cut twice, right? Measure once, cut twice. Uh, not uh, cut twice and measure once. This is uh, kind of the problem uh, going on here. So you really want to really uh, measure twice so that you don't do things uh, incorrect. And you really do want to make sure that you've got the right person that knows what they're doing, um, doing layouts that are fundamentally important when you're prefabbing something off site. And this is in the correct, incorrect spot, that's not great, right? Uh, so uh, that's a problem too, especially the asphalt's already done on the driveway and everything. And then this is in the wrong spot with the sauna tube and concrete. 
Uh, this was a giant slab. It was actually bigger than this. It was pretty far out in the condo and there was uh, some issue with, uh, with it and they had to uh, jackhammer it uh, out. So there's a lot of uh, these kind of defects that occur uh, in construction. Waiting, waiting for materials, waiting for tools, waiting for equipment, waiting for resources. This is a big one as well. That's where the supply chain management becomes important and uh, commitment of the trades that are involved. It does require different kind of contracts to make sure that the sub trades that are signing on with you are uh, committed to, there's a lot more planning up front and sometimes sub trades don't wanna be involved in that, but you need them involved because what happens is later on, they're standing there saying, oh, this slab's in the wrong spot. Much better to tell, to tell you that slab can't be there because of X, Y, Z yet ahead of time. Yes, they had to waste a few hours in meetings, but that's better than days with jackhammers. Transportation, delivery and placement of materials, equipment, movement within the site, site logistics, lack of wasted motion. Uh, in other courses, I talk about the washroom and just the back and forth and where it's located and those types of things. Delivery of materials. Can we get it close to where it needs to go? Do we have equipment to move it close to where we need to move it to? Is this a, a been set up? Or are we doing things that is taking a lot of extra time and costing a lot of extra money? Motion. Well, you can look at any skilled craftsperson in their field and you can watch how they work. Uh, and uh, somebody that's really skilled is a marvel. It's kind of like watching an artist work. Uh, somebody that's not so skillful, it's not so artistic and there's a lot of waste. Can we train people to get them that they are uh, effective in this area and have we thought through our projects um, for that so that we're not doing excessive waste do we have uh, tool cribs that are set up with the right tools and equipment in it so that there's not a lot of back and forth to uh, the shop uh, which is maybe 10 miles away from the site inventory we don't want to have things at way ahead of time, right? We want to try to schedule things close to the work, most responsible time. Uh, and we don't want it to be in the way of the work. So we want to make sure of that. And we don't want to be ordering tons of extra materials either that we end up with a lot of waste. That's the other thing, um, trying to get that um, as close as possible. Overproduction is actually doing more than you need to do. Well, it's surprising that we actually do do that sometimes where we do more of something than we actually needed to. Overproduction could be a plumbing subcontractor and they're prefabbing shower, um, shower supply lines and with the control valves. And so they actually do like four or five extras. And then when they're done, they've got four or five extras and then they end up throwing them out. So overproduction, doing more than you need to. Unnecessary process steps. So making sure that we have uh, processes in place and that we don't do unnecessary steps. So uh, you can think about, we actually have a term in, in lean construction, we call it value stream mapping, where we take what we're doing and we break it into individual components, step-by-step -step components that we, uh, it's a flow chart and we really collaborate with the team to try to figure out which components of this can we reduce or eliminate? How can we get this from being a six-hour process to a three-hour process? Sometimes government organizations will do something like this with construction projects and look at it seems to take us uh, 60 days to approve a change order internally. And so then that causes this ripple effect on the construction projects. Well, it's the bureaucracy in the government agency that is making it take 60 days. So um, you basically have a value stream mapping session where you bring somebody in with everybody that's involved at the key touch points and you try to work out what, what happens to it from this stage. What hap why does it take a month from here to get to there? 
what is happening during that month and you look at okay so this is happening this is happening can we eliminate this or can we reduce this to make it shorter and they they've had instances where they've taken something that takes 60 days and brought it down to 35 days 35 days still isn't great but it's better than 60 days and then once it's at 35 days then you still would be wanting to come back and once you've tried and smoothed that out lower the river and try to shorten that again maybe get it down to 25 days uh, so those are some of the uh, instances where that's occurred and that's occurred for government agencies right now where we are uh, in Ontario because they've instituted the um, the uh, construction act which requires payments to be made within 30 days well a lot of facilities and government agencies colleges universities that's like craziness for them to try to get that because of all the protections that are in place with sign-offs and then also bureaucracy so then they have to work to comply with government regulations to improve so all of a sudden they're able to improve well that means there's so many opportunities everywhere for these types of improvements I've mentioned in uh, our computer labs where we uh, do scheduling uh, that you know if I was going to be developing schedules for if I was a renovation contractor, I would have a template for with all the holidays built in for a bathroom, for a kitchen, for an addition, for a custom house, for a deck, all the things that I do kind of standard. And I would have a work breakdown structure that I could just go to and then start filling out the schedule. And if it's something simple like a bathroom, kitchen, house uh, addition, I would have a rough template with all the activities in it, too. Then I just have to go in and customize it for all the unique features, add activities, add costs, various items that are specific to that project. But at least then it would act like a checklist. How many process steps would I remove by doing that one thing? That's just one item. There are a lot of things we can do this in. And in construction, if you're somebody that actually thinks that way and I'm your boss, you're gold. You're gold to the company because not use Pareto, the Pareto principle. 20 out of 80 people might do that kind of thinking, think that way. And that 20 people, they're not looking for work. In a recession, if their company goes down, somebody's after them. They want to grab them because they know they're good. That's how that works. So that's how that thinking will help you. Not to mention how it helps your company. Oh, and the checklist, right? I think that was the other tool that I'd mentioned in the other course, uh, the other class that I'd forgotten, lecture three, I think, uh, having a checklist, right? So this helps that way with the checklist. So tying to that earlier tool that we talked about um, previously. So the last one is incorrect or underutilized talent. And I like to bring this one up. I bring it up a lot in different classes that I do because uh, it just makes sense, but I know people don't always remember things. So uh, incorrect or underutilized talent. If people are afraid to speak up, then their talent is underutilized. If people, maybe they're not afraid to speak up, maybe they're just a little bit more introverted. If they're introverted, then in that case, uh, you want to, if you're running a meeting, and we'll talk about uh, the short-term planning sessions, you want to try to get engagement of those people because very often they're the smartest one in the room, the quiet one. I've been shocked by that a few times uh, teaching courses. You know, I get a test and it's like 100% or it's 98% and the one question they got wrong, it wasn't that they got it wrong, it was that I did, uh, I circled the wrong box. I start to want to know who is this person? Who is that person? And uh, I had that one year and I was like, who's, where's Peter? I got to know who Peter is because Peter keeps getting a uh, hundred percent on the test and then very quiet individual, but very smart. And then when I would ask questions during the class, Peter, what do you think of this? Boom, right on with the answer. So you can imagine the underutilized talent that you have on a project. And if you're closing them down or not giving them the opportunity to speak, you're losing. They're not losing. You're losing. If you can engage them, they're winning, you're winning. The team is winning, the project is winning. That's lean thinking. Uh, I always think of a book, Smarter, Faster, Better uh, by Charles Duhigg. He's very um, 
uh, famous for the book uh, The Power of Habit, which is another very good book. Uh, and uh, in this book, he gives the example of uh, Lorne Michaels of Saturday Night Live fame. Um, so Saturday Night Live, SNL, better known. And uh, going back in the day, he talks about John Belushi. Believe it or not, Lorne Michaels has been doing Saturday Night Live from when I did that porch. So that's like before 1980. And uh, he said uh, John Belushi was an introvert and smartest comedian they had but sit there quiet. So we always had to figure out ways to get John engaged because as soon as John asked John and got him engaged, the funniest stuff, the funniest skits would come out. So you want to make sure that you're engaging with those people and you're finding ways that way uh, your projects will really accelerate and improve from there. So incorrect or underutilized talent. This one, I feel like we don't do enough, but that's where where we'll talk about another session, the last planner system really helps to get that engagement. That's a big part of it. There's process and technical aspects to it, but it's also that engagement of the smartest people in their fields, the smartest people in their fields. I think I mentioned the wisdom of the crowds uh, in a previous lecture. Wisdom of the crowds only works when you've got pretty wide, a crowd of pretty wise people. So if you've got good subcontractors that are involved in your project and you can tap their smarts in their specific areas and collaborate, your project is going to go much better than if you're trying to figure everything out. And then you're going to be just doing rework all the time because there's things you don't know. And then the sequencing was off. Something got done ahead of time. Something got done wrong. All of those kind of other previous seven wastes that we talked about are happening much more frequently reduce reduce the variation so the tool of the week the tool of the week uh, that we're uh, looking at um, is asking better questions tying to what we just said and the five whys and the five whys is a process so asking better questions, uh, most effective empowering questions, some examples. And some of these, uh, these examples I got from a Harvard Business uh, Review uh, article. You could look it up by Judith Roth. Uh, but they create clarity. Can you explain more about this situation? They construct better working relations instead of, did you make your sales goal ask, how have sales been going? Uh, the other one's more confrontational how have sales been going is trying to get a feel for what's going on and maybe get you to elaborate uh, so you can rephrase this anyway in a construction project uh, they help people think analytically and critically what are the consequences of going this route so if you have an idea and a plan you could ask and you could present the plan you could say but I'm trying to figure out what are some of the consequences going this this route. If you phrase it in that way, people are generally more than happy to say the downside of it uh, because you're, it's like you're asking them. They inspire people to reflect, see things in fresh, unpredictable ways. Why did this work? I know it worked, but why did this work? And remember, we also talked about uh, the aspect of thinking in bets and probabilities in one of our earlier lectures. You could have a good outcome but have made a bad decision. Asking this question will help you determine was it a good decision that we got this good outcome or was it a bad decision and we got lucky? And if that's the case, then how do we make sure we don't do that decision again because I don't want to be dependent on getting lucky the next time. They encourage uh, breakthrough thinking. Can that be done in any other way? Open-ended question. Can we do this in any other way? Trying to pull out, pull people into it. Uh, they challenge assumptions. Why do you think you will lose if you start sharing responsibility for the implementation process? And if there's certain assumptions built into that, you're challenging it. Create ownership of solutions. Based on your experience, what do you suggest we do here? So that's asking for their opinion. Your value, your, your, it's that, that previous slide where you're trying to engage them. You're, you're valuing their experience. You ask a plumber, an electrician, a stonemason, and you phrase it in that way, 
they're really smokes coming out their ears they're really trying to figure out what's going on here right so uh, just to, just thinking about how you ask questions it's, I don't think we do that enough I don't think I do that enough so I don't and I know these things and I want to do it more uh, good questions for the team in your experience what do you feel we do best as a team I should probably have a question mark there why do you think we are able to solve that complex stacking problem on site? Uh, what, what can we do now to avoid scope gaps in the future? How can we apply what we are learning in this phase to the other parts of our work and other similar projects? How can we build better relationships with our clients, subs, and suppliers? Good questions, good questions for the team. You've got a meeting and you're meeting with the project team. These are some good questions. You could think of a hundred other ones that are, are good for the particular circumstances. So the last one is the five whys tool. And it's a, you know, you can Google this and you'll see all kinds of data and information on the five whys. Uh, really, it just means you don't stop at the first why. You keep asking more questions on the topic. So if you're asking somebody, why did this happen? And they explain, they probably didn't go deep enough in their explanation. So you read what their explanation is, and then you could say, why did that happen, though? And then they will go deeper. But why did that happen? And then they will go deeper. And at some point, you will get to the root cause of the problem. It could take three whys. It could take seven whys. It's usually like five whys is why they say the five whys. It doesn't have to be five whys if you get down to the lowest level. The point is to keep trying to dig till you know you're at the source. Because if you stop at the first one, you're treating the symptoms. You're not treating the disease. So that's what you're trying to do. So an example, you've been called to investigate a flooded basement. There is a basement that's flooded, quite wet, and the drywall and the exterior wall is quite damaged directly below the window. The carpet is damaged for quite a sizable area near the damaged wall. So this is all filled up with um, water. So the five whys would be the basement is flooded and the basement is severely damaged. So why is the basement flooded? Water came in through the window from the window well. So the water came in through the window, through the window well. Uh, why did, and this isn't the actual one that caused this flood, but it's a window well. Uh, why did the water come in the window well? Um, the window, in from the window well, the window well filled up with water. It filled up with water. So why did the window well fill with water? There was a big storm and the eaves trough overflowed above the window well. Now we're right on, we're on the right track because we're asking why the basement flooded. Somebody might say it came in through the wall, but we kind of did some detective work and seen that it's uh, coming in uh, from the window well. And so now we're asking why did it, like why would this fill with water? Like I can understand maybe lower, but why is this thing filling up with water? And you could tell by the water running down the wall, like there's all these marks on the wall. Uh, so there was a big storm and the eaves trough, which is above, you know, on the roof above this, well, wouldn't you know the east trough overflowed above the window well? So it came roaring over the window well from the big storm. The window well, the real one, is older, so it was kind of clogged up the drainage pipe that goes down to the weeping tile. It was kind of clogged up. So the window drainage pipe to the footing is clogged. So you got two things going on. One, you got east troughs overflowed, and then the drainage pipe of the footings is clogged. So sometimes the five Ys can even break up into more pathways is what I'm saying. Sometimes you have like a little bit of a tree going on with the, the pathways of the Ys. Because now I got two pathways to work on. So why did the east trough overflow over the window well? During the winter, the snow and ice built up and loosened the connectors, dropping the middle section of the east trough lower than the lowest end of the east trough. So in the winter, if you get ice damming occurring, it, it just weighs like a ton on the east trough and it lowered it enough that during the summer it was lower than 
the downspouts, the rainwater leaders. So if that's if that is the low point, the water is going to fill up and then come over the top. Why did the connectors come loose? Well, when it filled up with ice, that's one thing, but they really came loose pretty easily because they weren't even the the nails and the furls, they weren't they were only nailed into the fascia. Uh, they weren't in nailed into where the rafters are. And the fascia was only three quarter of an inch fascia board. It didn't have the thicker sub fascia that would probably have held it. So it just pulled away. And so we, we, we looked at that, uh, 4A and 4B, but also why is the window well clump? Years of sediment filling up in it. Solution, fix ease trough to collect the low point and ensure it is clean regular. Dig and replace clogged drain pipe from window well, damp proof wall in this section. Check for structural cracks in case you have to do epoxy injection. Uh, and budgeted solution, place cover over window well to limit uh, water exposure. So there's, there's your five whys going down to the root cause, just as a simple example of it. But you, any project uh, you're, you're digging, and as I said, you might not, like I went uh, four and I had two paths, so this really had five on this, and then this had four on that, so, but, that's the way it works. And it's a great tool. Don't, don't stop before you get to the root cause. So I hope you enjoyed today's lecture on lean. Gotta love lean, uh, that's for sure. Uh, and really get your way thinking on these ideas. Cost control, it, I, in a way, I don't know, cost control, that's the name of the, 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 the course that we are doing. Uh, I've, if I w had my druthers, I would probably want to uh, rename it something to the effect of profit acceleration or maximization. Uh, it'd be a little bit, uh, sound a little bit better or value, value acceleration. Uh, so maybe I'll have to think about that one. Maybe I can get that changed in a few years. Or just I'll call it something different, even if it's uh, a college course and they call it something else. I do those things sometimes. All right, so this is uh, Tom Stevenson wishing everybody a wonderful day, and I'll see you next time. Bye for now.